Hey, I travel a lot for work right now over in Europe at the British Grand Prix covering the Formula One events, and I'm always jumping on to different Wi-Fi networks, and I like to make sure that my information is staying secure, so that's why I use a VPN. And first and foremost, you know, security is of the utmost importance, especially when connecting to unfamiliar networks. So private internet access ensures your online activities remain secure, even when you're on the move. By encrypting your internet connection, it prevents anyone from intercepting your data or eavesdropping on your online communications. This means you can browse with confidence and peace of mind. So if you want to enjoy all the benefits of private internet access, now's the time to subscribe. Head to piavpn.com slash nailing the apex and get an 83% discount. Seriously, 83%. That's just $2 and three cents a month. And you also get four extra months completely for free, but you must go to piavpn.com slash nailing the apex for a truly private digital life. One last time, that's piavpn.com slash nailing the apex. Get in on the action and make your bet with Sports Interaction. Summer is heating up with baseball. Can the Jays make a run at the division? Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, but you can bet before the game, whichever way you think, live and in play uh, at all your favorite teams and hot dog contests. Woo, woo. Sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN or download the app to get started. It's 19 plus. And what do you have to do, Steve? Please play responsibly. Welcome to Nailing the Apex, everyone. I'm Tim Haraney. Please head on over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow. Same goes with Apple Podcasts as well. Write reviews. It really helps us grow the pod. You can also watch us on YouTube now, and you can follow me on social media at Tim Haraney. Joining me today is the voice of the USF Pro Championships. It's Rob Howden. Rob, uh, how's it going, man? How you been? <laughs> Uh, life is good. Very, very busy. There's so much racing going on. And, you know, not only what I do with the USF Pro Championships, but I also own essentially the North America's largest karting website, eKartingNews.com. So I attend a ton of karting events throughout the year as well. So yeah, it, it, half the year I'm on the road somewhere at a race somewhere. So it, life is good and, and racing is fun. So for those who don't know, like Rob, you've been, I mean, you've been following racing. You've been covering racing, uh, since like I was 16, probably. So a very yeah. long time. I started the sport back in uh, 1994 as a cub reporter and an advertising salesman for Performance Racing News in Toronto. Uh, I've published my own magazine since then, obviously the websites as well. So yeah, it's coming on 30 years now, which is crazy to think about. That's awesome, man. Congratulations. Right? That's that's so, that. that's so awesome, dude, that you're able to turn this into such a full-time career, man. Right. Um, yeah, so I guess like, you know, a lot of what you do is covering a lot of the younger drivers who are who are coming up um, the ranks, especially, I guess, in the past with the Road to Indy uh, scholarship program that exactly yep. used to kind of be there. But for, for, for now, you know, can you explain the difference between um, the two USF Pro Championships? Essentially, the USF Pro Championships is the new name for the Road to Indy, right? That's what we had since 2010 when USF 2000 got restarted by Danny Anderson and Anderson Promotion. So that's been kind of the entry level for a lot of drivers coming out of karting or F1600 into, you know, slicks and wings race cars. Uh, they're at Toronto every year with USF 2000. We have a series before that and a series after that now. Now it's USF Juniors. That's where you start when you're 14, 15, 16 years of age. You start in juniors. You win the championship there. You win a scholarship over $225,000 to move up to USF 2000. That's the next level. From there, you win a scholarship if you win the championship there, uh, over 440000 to make them move up into USF Pro 2000. That category just two steps away from IndyCar. And then from, from Pro 2000, drivers will move into the Indy Next Series, which, of course, used to be called Indy Lights. Do the, is there a, um, so is there a, 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 a prize or a championship purse that – the uh that they can take with them into indy next indeed that's the whole, that's the whole program for our series obviously is the scholarships right so uh, if you win the usf pro 2000 category which is the top level of what we do in the usf pro championships the scholarship is about six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. you'll take that into the indy next program of course you have to find some more money after that still to be able to get it done but it's a significant amount of the budget for drivers to move up to that next level and that's you know we've, we've done a great job over the last number of years the reason why there's so many drivers in indy lights you look at them all uh, 75% of them came through our program to get there. Some, of course, coming in from other, other series around the world. But for the most part, USF Pro 2000 is the feeder series for Indy Next. 
That's awesome, man. It's really good. And it's good that there's a, a voice for it. It's good that there's coverage of it. Um, and you can watch most of these races on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we have, we have a downloadable app for the USF Pro Championships. We have live timing. All the uh, all the live videos are on there, live races, all the broadcasts. It's on our YouTube channel as well. So yeah, everything we do, all of it is free on YouTube to watch. And again, like I, I always say, to go, to go to a race like Toronto, right? The, the Honda yeah. Indy Toronto, where we have USF 2000, USF Pro, and we have uh, the NTT IndyCar Series. Essentially, it's like going to a, a Blue Jays game and being able to see single A and double A ball at the same time, right? You get you get three games in one. That's the beauty of it. You get to see the future stars for sure. And, uh, you know, just for people to to watch out for, are there any young drivers that are currently uh, on your on your radar? Because, you know, you've got your finger on the pulse of all that. I think one of the big ones everybody looks at right now is Miles Rowe. He was part of uh, Penn State Entertainment's Drive for Equality and Change. You know, young black driver uh, from New York, uh, just recently graduated from Pace University. Uh, it's got the first, he was the first black winner in, in the, what was the road to Indy then, the USF Pro Championships a couple of years ago. Almost won the championship last year in USF 2000, but he is coming out of the gate like a, an absolute bear to start the season here. And as we go into the second half, he's the point leader by over two full races of points. He's had such a good year. Not only has he won a lot of races, and he won again this past weekend in Toronto, uh, but he's also been consistent. I think he's only had like two, you would call bad races. So he is the the outright leader in that championship right now, Miles Rowe, again, out of Brooklyn, New York. He'll be in Indy next, 100% next year. So he's going to be the, the, the a future star in IndyCar for sure. A young Brazilian named Kiko Porto as well, I think, is one to watch, a former USF 2000 champion, both he and Michael D. Orlando, who won the championship last year, both with the, with the skills to get all the way to IndyCar. It's whether they can find the budget to keep going. And another that we love watching is uh, Salvador de Alba. He's a young Mexican driver who runs in the USF Pro uh, with exclusive Autosport, a formerly uh, Canadian-based team. The, the, uh, the owner's still Canadians. They are now down in Brownsburg. But de Alba... The great, great thing about him, Tim, is not only does he run with us in the USF Pro Championships, he wants to go to IndyCar, but he's also a superstar down in Mexico in the NASCAR Mexico Series and the Super Copa Series. He'll go back and forth and do a NASCAR Oval and then come back up and run the open wheel here. It's, he's, he's got such a diverse uh, package of skills, I think. So the uh, I, I was I was watching a lot of the racing this weekend, and um, you had mentioned Miles Rowe and yeah. uh, Michael uh, D. Orlando. They're... They're, I don't know I call it a rivalry, but they're... I would call it a rivalry, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, like, yeah. they're really pushing each other in that championship because it's actually, like, quite close for who's going to take over the lead in the championship. Well, I mean, Miles I, got, got a bit of a lead there uh, yeah, on, my, in race Miles two. Is, Miles is in a great spot right now, Tim. He he, he really, he's, he's mm -hmm. done so well. The, the issue is, so D. Orlando and Miles Rowe, along with Jace Denmark, were in a really great battle for the championship last year. Came down to Portland, the finale weekend for us on Labor Day weekend. Miles looked like he, he and his teammate, Chase Denmark, were going to fight it out. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Dear Orlando was third coming in, but with a lot of battling, Dear Orlando ends up coming out with the victory. So they do have a bit of a rivalry. They have a friendship. They go back and forth as well. Uh, Michael just didn't get a good start to the season. He had a bunch of bad luck getting taken out from races, having a mechanical here and there. And while that was happening, Rowe was just knocking off. He won three of the uh, first four races on the season. So he built this big gap. And he really hasn't let off the throttle. D. Orlando's coming on big time in the middle of the season. He's won a race at uh, at least one race of the weekend at the last three races. Road America, Mid-Ohio, and Toronto. He's slowly catching up, but not enough. Rose, it's Michael's going to have to go on a, on a streak of almost winning every race for the rest of the year. With his, There's five more races, two weekends. D. Orlando's going to have to go on a streak if he's going to challenge Rowe for the championship. Because there was, uh, I think it was race two on Sunday. I think they had a... Um... They had like a championship lead, points lead as it stood within within the yeah. race, and I think like Miles only had when D Orlando was in second, they're battling Miles for the 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 win. I think there was like a, a negative of seven points between the two of them. I have a feeling that one. I think that was a mistake on the live timing, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, I because I uh, D Orlando did have an issue, as, as he said, he had a fuel pump issue, was running second and fell to the tail of the field. Yeah, that live timing thing wasn't working very well. Yeah. I, I want to say the, it's over sixty points now for yeah. Miles Rowe. Uh, with five races to go. So he's, again, he's in a really good spot, but such an interesting young man too. It's not, he, he's got a karting background like a lot of guys do, but you know, a lot of racers will take marketing in school or business or engineering, right? Something really focused on racing. Miles is a kind of a, he's a really soft spoken young man. He took film and, and does a lot of photography at Pace University. Like so he's graduated. He's more of an artistic kind of creative type which is not kind of the, your stereotypical, you know, uh, equation formula that you use for a race car driver, but it makes him so calm on the racetrack. It's very interesting because he's calm, he's relaxed, 
but you never have to worry about him and his aggression because if there's an opening, he's going to go for it. Everybody in the paddock knows if, if, if there's an opportunity for him to pass, he's going to take it. And I think that's such a cool, cool kind of, you know, the, the two sides of him, the yin and the yang. If, uh, if he does like win this championship and, you know, gets promoted into Indy next, I mean, does, does force Indy kind of go with him at that point? Because at the moment, like force Indy is, is running Ernie Francis. So could they, essentially run two cars in that championship for the so, next year if Ernie sticks around? Yeah, well, see, so what Force Indy does, right, with with, uh, with Rod Reed is that uh, even though uh, Miles runs for uh, Paps Racing, so it's a Paps Racing program, it's still badged as Force Indy, so he's still supported by Force Indy. Same with uh, Ernie Fan- Francis, who runs with HMD Motorsports, right? So he runs with a team badged by Force Indy. Could we see two drivers with Force Indy badging next year and Indy next? A hundred percent. Because wow. although Ernie Francis hasn't really taken, you know, hasn't really set the world on fire, he's getting better and better, right? This is a guy that has so much experience uh, in Trans Am racing. Yep. You know, they put him in a, in a Trans Am car and he's going to win the championship. Uh, he's learning the kind of intricacies of running a, a high powered formula car. And he's getting there, no doubt about that. But I, yeah, we could easily see those guys side by side next year. Yeah, because the Indy Next car is not easy to drive. No, I mean, it's not. Like it, it's it very similar. Yeah, very similar to the Indy car to a certain extent. Because it usually takes uh, it usually takes a couple of years for drivers in the Indy Next machinery to actually get a handle on it and be quick right out of the gates. And that's just from me watching over the past few seasons of you know these drivers of when they're rookies they tend to struggle a bit, but then in their second year if they do have a lot of true talent then usually those are the ones that are battling for the championship. Um, we normally see drivers come through our ranks and do two years, right? Your first year you learn, the second year you win, that kind of a thing, right? We've had guys like Kyle Kirkwood, kind of a generational talent that stormed through and won every championship in a row. But even when, when you talk about the Indy Next Series, right, the races are longer. The cars coming from USF Pro 2000 add on another 200 horsepower. Mm-hmm. Now you have the turbo. You have to learn push to pass. Now, again, you know, we're Cooper Tires with our series. That's a Firestone tire, so they have to go up and learn the tire again. That's always a big thing to learn the tire. What does it want in qualifying? How's it going to run through, you know, through a full, a full longer distance race run? How does it degrade? So, again, there's a lot, a lot to learn. Uh, the drivers are obviously all physically, you know, in t- tip top shape to be able to ready to go racing, but there's a lot to learn to be able to move forward and win those races, right? So that's why you'll see a lot of drivers, you know, Stingray Rob for one, you know, he really started kind of, kind of took off in his second year. Uh, running in the Indy Lights program. And, and that's, I think you'll see a lot of drivers get better in that second year. Let's talk about the uh, IndyCar race from this past weekend in uh, Toronto, the Honda Indy. Uh, Christian Lingard coming away with uh, his first ever uh, yeah. victory and second ever pole in the championship um, for his second year full time, even at IndyCar. Uh, you know, Rob, when you when you look at some of these younger drivers that are now coming into to, to IndyCar, are you surprised to see just the, the level of, talent that is now starting to come into this championship because it arguably i mean if you were to go back to like 2015 there could be an argument made that the, t- that the talent that, that was young coming in just wasn't wasn't there yet i think what we're seeing and it's it's some of the openings coming up you know like a when you get an opening at a, at a penske racing and they can they, they can you know, grab a guy like scott mclaughlin right not coming up through any of the formula car ranks but instead this you know the super cup series uh, down in uh, the, the supercar series rather down in Australia, uh, you get guys like that. And then when Scott comes in, people start looking, Hey, but you know what? This, maybe I can come here. Like Christian Lungard, you're seeing drivers come over, you know, Roman Grosjean being one as well. We just added all these guys that are, have been come up through. So you have the guys coming up to the ladder system, plus some big drivers from around the world. That's what I think's raised the bar so much. And I think the quality of teams is, is stepping up as well. You see, a lot, I think a lot of teams are making a, uh, outside the big three, big four are making big investments. We know, uh, you know, Arrow's obviously made a huge investment in what they're doing. Arrow McLaren, uh, AJ Foyd invested a lot as well this year. You know, look how good they were at the 500. They brought Michael Cannon over, the noted engineer. So they brought some good talent in. And I think maybe uh, even the underlying storyline for Christian Lungard, tremendous in the wet weather qualifying, which I thought was super cool that we had that qualifying session that was just so treacherous. Uh, He's able to get it done there. But I think the, the huge recovery kind of redemption story of RLL, Rahal Letterman Lanigan, after not qualifying for the 500, they, yep. you know, went back and uh, I'm sure that uh, Bobby Rahal was not pleased in a, in a team meeting. And, you know, they, they pressed the reset button and come back and to be able to win in Toronto. That is huge for that organization. What do you think? Um, what do you think caused that? Because I know like at the beginning of the season, I did a, was doing preview pods for IndyCar. And, you know, one of the things that I, 
had noted was, you know, RLL and the amount of money they had dumped into the infrastructure and the new factory that they had moved into and the, some of the team personnel they were bringing over, especially one in particular from Formula One. Yep. And, you know, you're looking at this team like, oh, wow, you know, they could be in the conversation as the team Penske's, you know, the CGRs, uh, you know, Andretti Autosport. But it just never, it never came to fruition for those first you know what i want to say like eight races so yeah. to speak but like what, what do you think is what, what do you think that was all down to i had a chance to actually go tour the facility when i was there in in march uh going cool. to my good friends is the vp on the uh, imsa side so he gave me a full tour through uh nice. while the guys were setting up for the grand prix uh event at, at indianapolis and the, the place is fantastic uh, and again i don't think it's fully leveraged yet either you know what i mean they kind of mm. just moved into it so i think although it's a fantastic facility they're really starting to pick things up and 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 really starting to kind of optimize uh, the new investments they've made. When it comes to the 500, I think we've seen so many teams. Sometimes you just go on the wrong path. You know, your mindset, you know, the the concept you have in terms of how you're going to move forward with the setup, what what's your baseline going to be like? This is what this is our our thought process. This is our kind of approach, our ideology for it. Sometimes it's just not right. You know, Penske Racing didn't qualify one year. We saw uh, Carlin racing with Pato Award. He and the Max Chilton that the year that Pato tried the first his first try to qualify, they just didn't have fast cars, right? And it yeah. it happens sometimes. It, it, and the Delta's not huge either. It's not like they're so far off. Um, everybody's kind of right there. But if you just, it's hard to make that move forward when you you're maybe just the mindset and the ideology is just not right. And it happens. You know, we always yeah, see guys struggle every year. Yeah, because Christian's been consistently i would say their fastest driver you know last season and again now and in, into yeah. this season where it's been kind of you know sh shocking really to see just how off the pace you know jack and and graham have been i mean graham obviously had some success there not too while not not too long ago but outside of that i mean for poor jack like uh I don't know. Do you do you see him back at the team next year? Like, I, I, you know what? And I, and I like. And he's Jack a good a driver. Lot. Like he's a good yeah. driver. I really like Jack a lot. He came, obviously mm -hmm. made his debut here in the U.S. with us when the Anderson Promotions had the Indy Light Series. So I have a chance to interview him a lot, and I, I like Jack a lot. Quality is a quality young man, and he's a great driver. He's just caught in a place right now that I just don't think he he's, he can't flourish. Right? He's not able to optimize the opportunity. Um, but and you see Graham struggling as well. He's later on in his career, as we know, and he's struggling a little bit. Um, and I think. I think when you struggle, you just get lost, right? The the communication between you and your engineer goes away. You, you start not trusting each other and and maybe the, it's just not going in the right direction. You know, there are times when I was interviewing those drivers, you could you could hear them say that. And I think you look a couple of years back when it was Graham and, and Takuma Sato. I think they were so, re I think they're very different drivers that want different kinds of cars. And, you know, there's Graham at 6'3", and there's Takuma at 5, whatever he is, 5'3", five, 5'4", five, whatever it is. That's, you think about just the size of them yeah. and the, the dynamics of the car and, and the, you know, the, the, the whole way they approach the cars was just different. So I think, I think Christian Lungard is going to be able to lead them in the right direction. I think this is a huge start for them right now. Anytime you can have a baseline like this, now when they go to St. Petersburg next year, the next street race, you know, they're going to, hey, you know what? Hey, we got a better baseline. Yeah. So I think a, a win like this will be a huge step forward. And I don't think they're going to be horrible at Iowa. You know, he's always, you know, Graham's pretty decent on the on the on the ovals if, if they get things dialed in. I think this is going to put them in the right direction moving forward for sure. Yeah, because I'd love I'd love to see that team, you know, yeah. getting into the mix with you know with everyone because I'm going to add you know Aaron McLaren into the mix of the top three too, right? So uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they're they're almost uh, they they probably moved ahead of Andretti. You know, yeah, I, I think you know for for the most part, <laughs> yeah, I know a lot sure. of the guys over at Aaron McLaren and they're digging a, digging hard too, and and they've got good people. You know, they they brought Gavin Ward in, and I think you know there's a as a, as a Canadians, you know. Gavin, who was was here, was an F sixteen hundred guy here in Canada. Went over to run uh, work in F one and is back. Um, a great guy, and Gavin, he knows his stuff. He's yeah. he's and listen, let's put it. It's Pato, uh, Alexander Rossi, and uh, Felix Rosenquist. Three fantastic drivers that can win anytime they get into a race car. Alex Pillow has been on a, uh, a pretty much of a tear lately, Rob. I mean, coming into the Honda Indy, obviously rattling off three straight wins yeah. and. He was going for that fourth straight win, and I, I believe if the stat is correct, which two people confirmed it was, but then I had another, a different stat. But I think it was uh, 
If he had have won four in a row, it would have been the first time since Sebastian Bourdais did that in 2006. I think that's what I heard as well. That was, yeah. a, that was a note that came across in front of me. It, listen, uh, Alex Pelot, you go a couple of years ago when here's a guy that was running for Dale Coyne and really didn't even have an opportunity to race, right? We asked him yep. at Mid-Ohio. I remember chatting with him. It's, I don't know what I'm going to be doing next year. I don't know that I'll, if I don't get a ride, I'm done. And he gets picked up by Chip Ganassi, obviously, and goes on a tear, as we know. Uh, he's just... He's a super, super talented driver, right? Came over from Super Formula. Everybody knew how good he was going to be. But I think we all, again, we kind of talked a little bit about with, with, with Ray Hall, with, with, with uh, Lungard, success breeds success, man. You mm-hmm. know, when you start winning races, it just makes it a lot easier. Um, the team has been, been great. His pit stops have been fantastic. They knock, they knock off six and a half, seven second pit stops all the time. They don't call it out a lot, but when you do an eight and a half second pit stop, yeah. you're losing so much time on the racetrack, right? Under yeah. green flag conditions. His stops have been fantastic. And the guy's just got so much confidence. Like, how did he do it yesterday with a, with a broken front wing <laughs> almost coming off? And I simply could not believe that he made it 42 laps. Like, I don't know how he did it on mileage. We know Herta did the same thing, and he didn't even make it around to uh, the pits after getting the checkered flag. It's amazing that he made it to the end. I don't understand how that front wing didn't break off and <laughs> go underneath either. the car. Like, I was yeah. looking into that braking zone coming down Lakeshore those last five laps, and I'm like – Man, this could be a really bad accident if that thing comes off. I can't believe like he wasn't black flagged or brought in at least. Like that they wasn't encouraged by IndyCar to bring him in to at least change that front wing. Uh, a little surprised by that, but not surprised by Colton Herta's performance. He goes well on the city streets of Toronto and finishing third, starting. I think it was P14. He yeah. he he left that. Um, yeah. What do you think, Colton, this season? I mean, it's uh, he's had some really great qualifying performances, but just stuff just happens to him in the race and it kind of just goes away from him. Just, just past we get to Toronto, I think the biggest thing for them, the reason why they started so far back is in the dry and all the practice, dry practice, they were unbelievably good. The Andretti cars were super fast. Kirkwood was on top the first practice session as well. So they looked really good. Didn't really star, I think, in the in the wet qualifying. That's why they were so far back. So we knew they were going to move forward. Uh, so yeah, not surprised that Herta was able to get to where he was to P3. Overall in the season, I think, again, we talk about success breeding success. Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, failures breed frustration as well. And I think that's, I, I think he's probably getting frustrated. He's still young, you know, he expects to win. You know, it's been, you know, people know now he's supposedly the highest paid driver in IndyCar, right? Getting a long-term contract with Andretti. There's the pressure of that as well. Got his dad in the mix over there with, with Brian too. Again, I think he's just kind of finding himself a little bit. And, and again, he's, he's, like you said, he's made a couple, he makes, Colton's got to tidy things up. In my opinion, and we yeah. saw this all the way through the, when, he was, when, when he was with the USF Pro Championships, he makes little mistakes you don't need to make when he's pushing over the edge. And I think once he's able to curtail himself back a bit, maybe get more of that Scott Dixon mindset that you bring home a car, you know, you bring home a result with the car you have. If it's not a winning car, you don't need to force a win. You can win championships finishing fifth every race. So I think once he backs things down just a little bit, then you'll see him get back to where he needs to be. And uh, speaking of Scott Dixon finishing fourth, he was the top driver in that uh, taking that alternate type strategy uh, yeah. to try and, you know, slow down Christian Lungard, but obviously not working whatsoever um, in their favor. But I mean, Scott is, and you could probably speak to this more because you've been around him way more than I have, but honestly, he's, Every single year, that guy is in contention for a championship. He is uh, unbelievable. He's a legend. Unbelievable. Like I mean, he's just the he's the best we've ever had as a complete package. You know, on the media side, away from the racing, all the times I've had to interview him when I was with with, uh, with IndyCar Radio, a consummate professional. Could bad session, good session. You are going to get the same Scott Dixon, right? He's going to give you the time. Always so professional, but the way he approaches the, these races, you know, he's got a great team. Obviously, Chip Ganassi racing is fantastic, as we know. Mike Hall, all the guys that he had, they have on the box. Um, he's just, uh, like I said, he's the guy that can make the most out of everything. You, you know, if there's a mileage run, the guy that's going to get the most mileage out of his machine is going to be Scott Dixon. 100%, he's the best when it, when it comes to, to fuel save. Uh, and then, like I said, he's got those smarts, man. The reason why he's won six championships is because he has the smarts. He does. He, he's not the guy that makes the mistakes like a Col- Colton Herta does, right? He drives the car to its, its limit and backs it up if he has to. And that's why you look at his body of work, right? How many times has he finished second? There's races he's never won before, but he's finished second like 10 times, right? It's You, you don't always need to win to win championships. That's why he's Mass- so good at it. Master of the fuel save, too. Uh, uh, Joseph Newgarden finishing fifth. Scott McLaughlin sixth. So the two uh, Team Penske drivers. And then Marcus Armstrong, uh, the top rookie in seventh. Yep. What have you made it? like? So obviously Marcus isn't doing the entire uh, championship. So for those of you listening or watching, uh, Marcus only doing the uh, road and street 
courses. I believe he's doing the short track race at at uh, in St. Louis. I, I think. don't know if he is or not. Is I'd he, love to see no? him do it, though. Okay. I, yeah, it'd be I, cool if he did. Yeah, I, he, I, I've heard that he's going to do a full season next year, so sooner or later he's going to have to get on the oval. And I think, listen, th- this guy's a, a supreme talent for sure. Yeah. There's no doubt. He's getting more comfortable being over here. Uh, obviously, you see the results. He's, he's not starting to knock out. He's, got, he's with a great team. Uh, I don't think he's going anywhere. I think they're going to lock him down. I, I would if I were them. I think uh, Erickson's more the kind of silly season guy right now, whether he comes back to Chip Ganassi or not. But yeah. um, I, Armstrong's super quick. And you mentioned Scott McLaughlin. We talked to him about the start. I thought, actually, Todd Lewis and I, who were kind of helping out with the broadcast there at the race, we um, I kind of thought he was going to win this thing because the, the strategy they had was mm-hmm. playing out where he was going to be able – I think he was going to be able to cycle back to the front. But uh, in the end, that little incident they had – with Kirkwood and um, Castro Nevis kind of ended that threw off their strategy and, and they did the best they could to get back to P6. Then you got Pato awards uh, coming home. P8 started third. And what have you made of Pato's season so far? I mean, like I sat down with him and, and, and talked about, it. I mean, he was like, cause I had asked him like, what, you know, what do you make of your, the first half of your season? And like, he was happy about it, but I don't think he was happy about the mistakes and, all of the uh, things that had happened, like the crash in Detroit, the crash in the Indy 500. Um, for for Pato and for for Errol McLaren, uh, it's uh, it's like they're knocking on the door of their for, yeah. of, of that win, right? I feel like for for Pato, it's kind of the season that's kind of got away from him. You yeah, know, you go you go from the very start of the year at St. Petersburg, he had the race won. Right, he was winning yeah. it. Then they had that uh, whatever it was a turbo misfire, fire. Yeah. misfire the turbo fire or something. He had the race one, ends up finishing second. There's been a couple of races where he's he, he hasn't been able to get what he needs because of a mechanical. He's made him a couple of mistakes here and there. It's just like like I said, it's the, it's the season that's kind of got away with, got away from him. He could have won races, but instead Alex Plo stepped up and kind of grabbed a hold of the horns when that happens. So uh, I I still think he has a long career. He's going to win lots of races. He's, I think he's going to win lots of championships. He's an unbelievably like purely talented driver with a lot of fire, huge for the business, obviously, because mm-hmm. all the Mexican fans absolutely love him. Pato's, uh, you know, very engaging with the fans <laughs> as well. I've, I've known Pato since he was like 12 or 13 years of age, racing go-karts, and he's been the same way the entire time. He's got a great personality. So uh, if, if IndyCar can hold on to him, if he doesn't end up finding his way to Formula One, I think we're going to have a lot of fun with him over the next 20 years. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that one. Uh, Graham Rahal, a pretty impressive performance yeah. from Graham dude backs like puts it in reverse like how, you know he's starting last or whatever it was he's got a train wreck in front of him throws it in reverse takes the uh, takes the off road to get back on right. dude finishes call. in the top 10 yeah. like that's an impressive performance he I I think he got like what was it mover of the day award yeah. or something like that from IndyCar and he's like yeah, I don't know if I deserve it but <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm super happy for Graham as well. I, I'm. I'm a big fan of Graham. I've, I, he does a lot of great stuff, not only for IndyCar but for the charities that they have within the team as well. Oh, yeah. um, but you know, the, the success, of course, of Christian Lungard, the win there, huge for Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan. But I think for Graham to be able to get back into the top ten, that's going to set off the second half of the season for him as well, right? He needs. Yeah. He needs some good results. Graham's a guy that I think kind of feeds on success. He needs to have that positivity around him when they get in a roll and they and they, and they have a couple of bad races. I think it beats him down a little bit. You'll watch what happened at the 500. You know, I, it's to see what happened there. I'm not getting into the 500. A guy who loves that race so much. You can see the emotion when the family was there. He's already, you know, he's, he's taken his lumps here in 2023. Yeah. I'd love to see this, this whole thing with Lungard and RLL, the whole team. I hope to see the momentum move forward because I want to see Graham finish the season off strong because you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Is he going to stay with the team? I don't see him going anywhere. I know there's all this talk where he may – I'm not sure if I'm signed for next year. I just don't see him leaving his dad's team. I, I, cause I, in the end, I think he's going to own the team and run it himself. So I yeah. don't know that he would ever leave. I know there's chatter of it, but I just can't see it happening. And you got uh, Marcus Erickson, Felix Rosenquist. So Rosenquist finishing P10 and then Erickson finishing uh, P11. And then, you know, you had mentioned it about like sort of this silly season with driver contracts and stuff like that. And – I mean, we got to factor Felix into uh, to all that as well. I mean, and I think, you know, from some of the folks who I spoke to in the paddock over the weekend, you know, it really sounds like Pelot is sort of that first domino to, yeah. to, to fall before 
we start getting some some movement and also mixed in there, I guess it would have to be Roman Grosjean as well. Well, that's that. I think the big big news that came out just the last couple of weeks is Andretti saying that they're no longer going to have essentially a, a you know a paid or a, a paid seat. Like a, they're not going to have that that uh, seat for Devlin D. Francesco. He brought obviously the money to that seat. They're going to go with four paid drivers. Uh, so they're not going to have a kind of, kind of four higher seat. And same thing goes with Ganassi, right? That's yeah. you know Ericsson brings his own sponsorship package to be in that car. He's not paid to be in the car. Listen, Erickson's an Indy 500 winner, right? He yeah. almost won another one. He, had they not gone back to green, he would have won a second uh, Indy 500. It would have been a lot of money in his pocket as well. So I think Erickson's, I think he's going to be very highly sought after. Somebody's going to grab him. Does Pelo end up at, at, at Arrow McLaren? Is that a done deal already? It could be. We haven't heard much about it. Do they expand to four cars potentially and keep Felix? That's a possibility as well. Uh, there's a lot of guys that you could see potentially moving around, I think. And, and David Malukas has already said he won't be back at Dale Coyne. So where does he end up to, right? Because that's a good talent there as well. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, I think I don't think we've seen anywhere near the full potential of David Malukas. Yeah. And not only that, he's a tremendous young kid, too. He's got yeah. such a great personality. Yeah. Uh, and he's just a pure kid. Like, just, he's an awesome guy. And, you know, he calls himself Little Dave after that, in, you know, after that <laughs> little chatter, the interview that they did at, at Texas uh, when he was up there fighting with the Ganassis and the Penskis. So um, I, he'll land somewhere. He's going to win a bunch of races, too. David's uh, he's a talented driver. What do you think about um, you know Alex going to to Aero McLaren and then let's just say okay so if Alex goes to Aero McLaren that's going to open up a seat at CGR mm-hmm. and then you got to got to take kind of take a look at okay well who's the next top talent that you know Chip is going to because Chip likes likes winners he likes winners yeah so what do you think you think if Aero doesn't ex- if McLaren doesn't expand to four cars so Felix would definitely be on the outs. Do you think Felix would end up going to that CGRC? I don't know. I I almost think Malukas maybe be the would be the guy mm-hmm. to go there. To be honest, I, I don't yeah. I don't really know. It wouldn't surprise me if Malukas Maluk, ended up there. You know, obviously we know Penske's locked in. They're not going anywhere right now. So yeah. uh, and Andretti and Andretti could have a couple seats too, right? I don't think Grosjean's. I don't think he's signed yet for next year as well. And then you got the open seat for Di Francesco, Kirkwood and Herta are locked. So a couple seats as well. Does 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 Rosenquist end up with Andretti? You know, that's a possibility as well. What do you make of uh, Grosjean's season? I mean, it hasn't been stellar. His qualifying has been very, very good. Yeah. But just the races, it doesn't seem like he can some, – some races you just can't piece it together or he's making little mistakes, crashing the car a lot. He's, he's caused a lot of damage. He's not, he's, not making any, he's not making any friends in the paddock either, is he? <laughs> no. He's, he's been into it with a couple of guys. As we know, Will Power yes. wants to punch him in the face. So yeah. um, there's, he's not making a ton of friends. He has, and he hasn't had that big breakout yet. You know what I mean? And again, these drivers, you know, they're professionals, but they're also, you know, they, you have to, you have to have a bit of an ego when you're a race car driver, right? Yeah. And success feeds that ego. It feeds that confidence. And I, in what I do with the kids coming up through the ranks, I talk a lot about confidence and momentum. Yeah, Confidence breeds momentum. And again, for, for Roman, he just hasn't won a race yet. He, he hasn't had that breakout where he's just, he's a guy everybody needs to watch out for. It's inevitably he makes a mistake or he's in the wall or whatever it may be, or, or gets, sometimes he just gets caught up in an incident that's not his own fault, but he just has not had that breakout yet. And I think, I think if you're Andretti, how, you know, how long does this experiment go for? Yeah. Exactly. When you got other drivers, right? Yeah, for sure. That's, that's what I'm thinking too. And like, I, I don't know. Uh, all I heard was from what he had said over the radio about losing the steering wheel out of his hands again. And, you know, was that a mistake? Was that from the bumps that were there? I mean, surely there were a lot of bumps. There's like there a were. crater in that corner. Um, but that being said, you should already know what you need to do back during practice. They didn't replay. I was I was wanting them to replay it again. I haven't gone back to watch it again. Yeah. I, have a, I think he might have hit the I, I, He says the wheel came out of his hands. Clipped I have a wall? feeling he hit the wall. I, I think he might have hit the wall and broke or broke this. When I looked at it, it looked to me like one of the one of the one of the tires was kind of up in the air, like one of the sides that had had been broken yeah. and squat the car down. And of course, it. you lose the balance. That's what, I think that's what it was because the hand because yeah. he said the he said his the, the, the steering wheel came out of his hands. But if you look at the replay, the wheel the, the car's wheels are still turned yeah. as he's going in. So that doesn't make any sense thing. to me. Yeah, right? I was thinking if the exact same if, thing. If your hands come off the wheel, the wheels everything's going to straighten back out. So yeah. I don't know. No, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's I don't know if I see him back at Andretti. I mean, if he gets a win, then maybe you know our our discussion on that changes. But yeah, sec- second definitely... half of the season for a lot of guys would change yes. things, right? If you go on to strictly, yes. if Felix Rosenquist ends up winning four of the next uh, whatever races, he's not leaving Arrow. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think I personally think they're going to go to four cars. Whoo! That's going to be Gavin's going to be busy, man. <laughs> <He is. laughs> well, they're moving. Sh- they're, I, so when I was in India, India, I told you I went to the Ray Hall shop. Um, so they're actually, 
Uh, I went to the, the uh, McLaren shop as well to see Billy Vincent and see Gavin and, and a couple of guys I know that they're there. They're moving out of that shop and they're moving yeah. into Andretti's shop eventually, right? right? So, uh, the, cause Andretti's building a new one. So there's going to be room for it there. I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised at all if they go to four cars in 2024. And, uh, just one more on, uh, Tom Blomquist, you know, getting his first, uh, taste of real <laughs> IndyCar. I mean, like he had a test, he did mention to yeah. us that he had a test a while ago, but that was a while ago. And like, I think he is from from my understanding he may be in that seat full time next I think season. He will be. Yep. Yeah. I think this he will is be. a uh this is like drinking from a fire hose though Rob coming to Toronto. They could not, <laughs> they could not put him in into a tougher situation. When I it's heard about the that they're like Tom Bump I go Toronto? Why wouldn't you run run him anywhere else? Don't run him yeah. I know si- I know Simon's going to be back. Connor Daly should have been in that car for sure. Yeah, I saw kept, Connor. Already- Already connected with the team at at uh, a little bit at Mid Ohio, he was there obviously as we know, but he should have been in that car. Yeah. It was just it was a no win situation for Tom, right? Just to be able to learn that to get back in a car at Toronto as <laughs> tough as it is, you could listen. And to his credit, he got faster and faster throughout the weekend, he right? And he and he was solid, turning better lap times in, in the in the race itself. But man. Uh, it just it was just a, such a hole to throw him into i just couldn't believe when i heard the announcement wow he, he he came in from uh friday's practice i think he'd done like 33 laps or something <laughs> and he literally came from car to press conference and he yeah. looked dude absolutely <laughs> shattered like <laughs> shattered i was like Not oh surprising. my god yeah. is that the ghost of tom Blomquist? like well there's literally like how <laughs> how much rest is there really in toronto you had to turn one None. and two you're you're turning the entire time you finally halfway down the straightaway kind of straighten the thing back out again and then you're right on the back onto the brakes in turn number three that it's such a busy racetrack and bumpy as we know so i'm not i turned i turned to our producer and i said to him i'm like i know exactly how he's feeling right now because i've (laughs) had to do something similar and it sucks but it's tough you you got to take those opportunities uh when they come Um, when you look at the uh the honda indy this year uh, what'd you make of it? I mean, when I came in on Thursday, things, you know, it was a little busy, but then like Friday, Fan yeah. Friday was was jammed. I've never seen it that that busy before, Rob. What did you make of the we, whole weekend? We did our autograph session for the USF Pro Championships uh, in the middle of the day on Friday, and it was packed. It was that we were there. We had, we had a lineup for a half an hour. A lot of guys were already lining up for, for the IndyCar autograph session, which wasn't for like another hour after us. There was at least 300 people waiting for something was happening an hour later. So um, I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. The place was packed. I know some people in our paddock were trying to find grandstand seats because they hadn't got any and there weren't any available, mm. which, you know, every shot you saw on the big screen and on the coverage with NBC uh, on Peacock, um, every grandstand was packed. And it was, it, it just felt, it felt like it was a huge event, right? You could yeah. feel the buzz the entire time. Yeah. Uh, all the people that were down at Victory Lane at the end of the day as well for Christian Lungard, yeah. it was just, it was just, the vibe was fantastic. I just, I, you can see guys walking around. There's lots of IndyCar shirts, a lot of Formula One fans, of course. It's Canada, right? We know we have a lot of great Formula One fans here as well. Uh, fans of the NASCAR Pinty Series too. You know, they ran yep. on Friday. So the place was packed. I, I just, I'm super happy that the event's got this kind of momentum. And, you know, the, you hear word that they're potentially going to announce an extension uh, on yeah. the property, which is great for Green Savory as well. And Jeff Atkinson, the president of the event. I just think uh, this it was just a huge race this year. Like you said, Friday was packed. We had a ton yeah. of people, even in our paddock, right? Not even yeah. coming to the IndyCar paddock. They yeah. were all coming into our USF Pro Championships paddock as well, getting to meet all the drivers. So it was big. Yeah. I I think uh, not enough gets said for what Jeff Atkinson and his team does over there at the the Honda Indy, trying to put all this together and put the show on. Um, really remarkable job for sure, no no question. And yeah. I, you know, it's interesting to know. Like, like I don't I don't even I don't even know if Jeff knew it was going to get this big this year. Like I don't think he was like prepared for like just how because I was talking to him like, dude, yeah. like I mean, it's Friday is crazy. He's like, this is great, isn't it? I mean, like, you know how Jeff well, does, right? He gets so amped up. He's and, awesome. and indeed, and I talked to him a couple <laughs> months before, and I think, hey, how are things looking? He says, our like our pre sales are way ahead of where they were last That's year. That's awesome. Right? So, and again, this you know we expected that coming out of COVID. People wanting to get back to the track, get back to outdoor events, but you know we're a long way way down from COVID now yep. in 2020. This is yep. uh, is a pure excitement for the series, right? Pure excitement for the event itself, and that bodes well because listen. Where where I give props to Jeff is every other racetrack around, even St. Petersburg and Long Beach, right? The the other street circuits. Mm-hmm. Um, they're kind of embedded in where they are. The track doesn't change. Mm-hmm. It just seems as things keep getting built around Toronto, it's always yeah. this kind of, you know, this kind of evolving <laughs> deal. Like we can't do this anymore. We you know, we gotta change the paddock. They built a hotel in the middle of the ra- our racetrack and and so shout out to them and for everything they've done, all the you know, the advancements they made, a little bit more pavement going down. 
where do they put the next grandstand? When you I fill out, ask you, that. you got you to jam another grandstand somewhere, man, because yeah. people are excited that they want to sit somewhere and get comfortable. So I think you, I wouldn't be surprised to see another big grandstand somewhere around the racetrack. Where would you, because I had a ton of questions from like on Twitter and yep. people like fans in the paddock who, you know, recognize me or whatever, but they, everyone said the same thing. Like, why isn't there another grandstand? And if there was, you know, where can they put it? Like, I actually had people sending me screen grabs really? of like satellite images yep. of the ground saying, you could put one right here and you can run the pit lane down the opposite side of Lakeshore Boulevard. And I'm like, I don't think <laughs> nah, that that's would not gonna work. work. <laughs> I think it, personally, I think uh, on the outside of turn one, yeah. You could probably try to jam something there so in turn too. number one. It's a great place to watch from. Yeah. And then when they come back out of three and four over to turn five, there's a left-hander there. They could put a big grandstand there. It would take up a little bit of that paddock over there, but they could put a huge grandstand there. That way you're seeing the guys come out of that kind of corner all the way through five to six. I think that's a, a, enough of a racetrack, so it's not just a one kind of one shot. Same thing in, in turn one. You get to see them all the way through there. Yeah. So I think those are the... Those would be the two places I would look at because I, I know that being over in five, there's room in five, turn five for sure. Do you remember? Because uh, they used to have one. Was it on the? It was on the outside of turn six, I think it was over I by. I don't recall that one. That's a possibility um, too, for sure. I want to say two thousand. No, probably ninety nine. It, it was there, and then they right. had, then they had another one on Lakeshore on the opposite side. So across, so on the exit oh, really? of turn okay. two. There was yeah. one there a long time ago. Why not? I remember that. But it's like, I think there's room to add one more considering the appetite that was there over the weekend. Like it was- Hey, listen, for the bottom line on the, on the race itself, that's revenue. I mean, it, yeah, if, you, if sure. you filled every seat and there's, you know, if, it's supply and demand. If, uh, if the demand's there, you need more supply, get another one in there. I guarantee you, Jeff is sitting down with, with uh, Kim Green and, and Kevin Savory to talk about that. Where, where do we where do we make more money? And yeah. that's let's get let's get another another grand stand up somewhere. The, the interest is there. The uh, where do you think all this interest is is coming from? Like, do you think it's the drive to survive effect, and then fans just wanting more racing in this seeing IndyCar and saying, hey, I can go and watch more racing over here. I think I think the success of the event, um, you know, a little FOMO to a certain extent, man. Everybody, everybody said, did you did you go to the race? No, I missed the race. I'm going next year for sure. I think that's a big part of it. I think you know, the word of mouth is bringing things in. No doubt in my mind that the drive to survive, even though focused at Formula One, has just turned a bunch of people into racing fans. Yeah. And when they see the price of what it costs to go to Montreal yeah. or Las Vegas or Miami or Texas, whatever it is to get you, know, it's it's the price to go to an event and have any access at formula one is ludicrous. We know that it's just, it's, um, it's crazy where you have free, you know, free Friday, you can come out to the racetrack. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that's helping a bit. People coming out on Friday and want to come for the rest of the weekend. But I think the drive to survive has turned a lot of people uh, who weren't racing fans into fans because they see the, the human side of it. Right. And the same mm -hmm. thing is with Indy cars. So I, I think and the access of course is fantastic. I think a lot, a lot has to do with just new fans completely. The hundred days to Indy. Did you watch it? I watched a couple of them. I, I just you, I haven't had think? a chance to. I thought it was okay. I, yeah. I enjoyed it. I was just so busy. I didn't get a chance to watch the rest of them, to be honest. Um, and I, I and I'm already pretty deeply into it. I know everybody, so I know all the stories. So it's not like it was anything new for me. So uh, I know a lot of people that did watch it. Um, I, th I thought it was good. I thought it was you know it's a great. It, it was a good program. I, I didn't I didn't think it was quite as good as Drive to Survive. I didn't. Yeah. I like the way Drive to Survive approaches things. Yeah. Uh, but that's their first shot at it, man. You know, we've we've heard that they're potentially going to do it again next year. So once you've done one, make some fine tuning, see what see what worked, what didn't work, and I expect to see a better show next year. Yeah, I would like to see it jump onto a, a streaming service because you can't watch it up here in Canada. And you know, we were, you know, I was told you know a while ago that we we may be able to watch it on on Vice, but we still you still can't see it up here. Um, yeah, yeah. But I would. We're actually, the funny thing is, you know, that whole drive to survive thing. Everybody loved it so much. We're actually for the USF Pro Championships. We're kind of doing our own that's main awesome. documentary, right? That's awesome. People love it, right? We call it the climb. They're about eight to twelve minutes, and they're available on our app and on our YouTube oh, channel cool. as well. So it's the it, it's cool to see that happen, right? Because that was kind of the first thing we saw. Obviously, they're doing one for the PGA Tour as well now. You know, there's there's a bunch of different deals like this these series that are bringing people inside in more inside it. They have it for IndyCar. We have it for our deal as well with our, with our mini doc. So 
I like it. I think it's a really cool thing that that uh, that's kind of got started in the sport. It's just that inside look that nobody else would yeah. get, right? More up close and personal. I, I love the approach. It's like the fly on the wall sort of aspect where yeah. you know you, you peel back that yeah. curtain and people actually kind of get to see what's actually going Agreed. on in there, right? Which is great. Um, yeah. Rob, thanks very much for taking the time to do this. This has been awesome. Uh, can you let everybody know what you've got going on, where they can find your stuff, and what's coming up for you? Yeah, so first and foremost, I've started at the bottom. eCardingNews.com is my is the website where we cover all the carding in, in North America. Uh, everything we do, of course, with the series, USF Pro Championships. They have their own uh, uh, sites, USF2000.com, USFJuniors.com, and USFPro2000.com. And, and you can download the app as well, USF Pro Championships app. Uh, that's where all the, our coverage is. I'm on Twitter at Rob Howden, Instagram at, at Rob Howden Racing, and just Rob Howden on Facebook as well. And like, uh, you know, you've, I, I, I failed to mention, you know, like you've actually worked in, and, you know, covered like Formula One drivers who were well, in junior yeah. categories. Well, I'm super lucky that this, like, you know, you look at, like, there's a lot of races that I've covered for Supercarts USA. And, um, you know, I, I used to have magazines back in the day, mm-hmm. Shifter Card Illustrated, Formula Car Magazine. And yeah, listen, everybody comes through the ranks, right? At that, at the, at the Super Nationals in Las Vegas every year. You know, Max Verstappen was there, Charles Leclerc was there, uh, George Russell, a young George Russell, young Lance Stroll. They both those drivers won the junior categories out there. Michael Schumacher came one mm-hmm. year, so yeah, I, I've I, I've been lucky to have a chance to uh, to work with so many of these pro drivers when they were kids, right? When they were young, you know, Graham Rahal is another one as well. James Hinchcliffe, of course, I've known James since he was again 10, 11, and twelve. Robbie Wickens, the same deal. Uh, it's it's Part of what I love, what I do, the simple fact that I get to be with the kids from five, six, seven years of age, same with Pato Award, until they get all the way to IndyCar, which I think is super exciting. Rob, thanks again for your time, man. Really appreciate it. This has been fun. My pleasure, Tim. All the best.